Welcome to the Common Man Football Show. My name is James Cobert, and today's episode is the Atlanta Falcons draft class. Starting with the first pick of the draft, Takeris McKinley, defensive end out of UCLA. Uh, when it comes to his production profile, he scored 95.31 in terms of solo tackle market share, 94.47 in terms of sack market share, and 99.25 when it comes to tackle for loss market share. And based on his schedule, his schedule uh, adjusted production, he had 99.62 out of 100. He was one of the most productive defensive ends in my data set in the last 20 seasons. Just take a step back to, 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 to soak that in. Uh, tremendous, tremendous player when it comes to production and market share uh, for, his, for his level of competition that he had to deal with. But unfortunately, his big issue is just with athleticism. Uh, only scored 59.61 in terms of explosives for his size, 92.10 in terms of speed for his size, and only 33.25 when it comes to flexibility for his size. This is the one area of concern that I had about Takers McKinley when it came to just his uh, athleticism on film is that he was explosive, he was fast, but he wasn't always great when it came to leverage and just you know getting consistent flexibility and dropping those hips and getting, you know, just getting great leverage at times. So, uh, you know, he's a guy that has a skill set in terms of explosiveness and speed that there are good things. Again, tremendous produ tremendously productive player. Uh, there are other types of players like this that have become successful players. Uh, and these are some of those players in terms of athletic skill set. Uh, so he kind of has that. Cameron Wimbley is another guy who, uh, just one specific example is a guy who has a very similar uh athleticism sort of skill set but the thing that makes McKinley a little bit more impressive than Wimbley is just production because like this is Wimbley's production at Florida State and then this is McKinley's production at UCLA so you're you're basically getting a, a much more productive younger version of Cameron Wimbley and Wimbley was an NFL starter and was a pretty high quality guy at times had, had his moments in terms of games uh, so I think this is the excellent pick for them uh, again, high quality outcomes are just not that great with this pick, but when you just look at the production, you look at the age, you look at all those other marks, you look at the fact that he does have a skill set that can be effective against certain offensive tackles at the NFL level based on explosiveness and speed, and you just have to think to yourself, yeah, this guy's going to work out. You know? So again, consistent high quality outcomes are just not necessarily on the table for McKinley based on his athleticism traits. But he does have enough positive things, elite things, that I think that'll carry his profile a bit to where he'll be at least a near elite type of pass rusher if you just get him into the right matchups. Uh, and then we come to the next pick in terms of Duke Riley, linebacker out of use out of uh, LSU, excuse me. When it comes to his production, he scored 70.84 when it comes to solo tackle market share production. Uh, based on that production, again, uh, 100% of multiple Pro Bowl linebackers since the 1996 NFL draft class had at least 77 or higher when it comes to solo tackle market share, and 100% of multiple All Pro linebackers Ray Lewis, Luke Keekley, Navarro Bowman, Patrick Willis, all those guys, Ryan Urlacher, uh, all those guys had at least 91 or higher when it comes to solo tackle market share production. And Duke Riley unfortunately doesn't hit that area. Of solo tackle market share production, but he does hit an area where there's at least starter potential. Uh, he's basically he basically has the same solo tackle market share production of Ruben Foster, just to put that into perspective. Who was a guy that people were comparing to Luke Eakley. Uh So like, production is not necessarily it doesn't kill him, it doesn't hurt him. Like he's not tremendous, he's not so unproductive that there's like no shot of him making it. And he does have positives in terms of his athleticism, where he scored 69.65 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 86.1 now when it comes to speed for his size, and 91.81 when it comes to flexibility for his size. I think the best case scenario for Duke Riley is he becomes a long-term starter for the Falcons. He's never going to be your best linebacker on your team, but he at least is going to be a very good complementary linebacker to your team. And I think that he will eventually become part of that starting rotation there, part of that starting group of the Falcons going forward. So it's it's a good pick. You know, you got a starter here that's decent. And then you can come to the next pick in terms of Sean Harlow, offensive guard slash center from, uh, well, not center, but guard slash uh, 
offensive lineman from Oregon State when it comes to his athleticism. He scored 74.20 in terms of explosives for his size, 71.77 in terms of speed for his size, and 31.98 when it comes to flexibility for his size. The flexibility is not that great, but he does have tremendous, uh, very good explosives, very good speed, and this is actually him compared to Ethan Posick. So he's actually somewhat a better athlete than Ethan Posick, uh, just, just in terms of that sort of perspective. So there's positives here. Based on his flexibility, this is more of an anecdotal thing. I haven't like done a study looking at all the tackles or guards that were bad in, in flexibility and to see what that did to their, their uh, pass protection. Uh, but usually they don't do well. As an anecdotal example, most of the offensive guards who end up having below average flexibility usually have issues in terms of pass protection. And really, realistically, it makes sense because of anchor. You know, if, if you're a less flexible offensive lineman and you're not able to, to, to get lower than the other guy because you're just not flexible enough to, to anchor down and get underneath the pads of another guy because you're just not flexible enough to get underneath those pads, uh, you usually have issues in terms of pass protection. Uh, in terms of stuff like that, but there's a way around this, which is called up-tempo offenses, quick passing offenses, stuff like that. So this is more of an issue if you want to have a quarterback who just sits back there for 10 seconds and then throws the football. But if you're the type of team that has like a quick timing, quick pass type of uh, passing scheme, uh, this is something that can be mitigated. The issues can be mitigated with with a guy like this. So. He's, he's a guy who really fits in the ZBS scheme, which is what the Falcons have, uh, at least right now. So he fits that sort of scheme. It's just somebody that you have to understand that from a pass protection standpoint, there's going to be some potential issues when it comes to that. It's going to be a thing that you have to scheme around a bit because, because of that lack of flexibility. And then we come to the next pick in terms of DeMonte Casey, cornerback out of uh, San Diego State. When it comes to his production, he scored 96.16 in terms of solo tackle market share. 90.85 when it comes to pass deflection market share. And, but unfortunately, he misses the mark in terms of high quality outcomes uh, when it comes to his age and when it comes to his uh, athleticism. His age score was 8.01. There has not been a multiple all pro Pro Bowl cornerback since the 1989 NFL draft class with an age score that low. On top of his athleticism, where he only had 37.87 in terms of explosives for his size. 33.43 in terms of speed for his size and 15.03 when it comes to flexibility for his size. All those marks aren't great. The worst mark is the flexibility score. There have really not been any long-term starting cornerbacks with a, fle with a flexibility score that low for their size. Um, he's very productive, very high solo tackle market share, very high pass deflection market share. But based on his age and based on his athleticism, this is someone that I think more like, more than likely becomes more of a backup uh, slash spot starter than a high-quality player. Uh, and then we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of Brian Hill, running back out of uh, Wyoming. When it comes to his production, he scored 94.85 in terms of total offensive market share production. He has a very good age score in terms of 93.76. And when it comes to athleticism, he scored 63.90 in terms of explosives for his size, 59.57 in terms of speed for his size, and 58.09 when it comes to flexibility for his size, which is the only thing that really hurts his profile because uh, based on the data that I've done, 100% uh, of multiple all pro, pro slash pro bowl running backs since the 1999 NFL draft class had at least one athleticism trait that was 79 or higher. Uh, so whether it was explosiveness, whether it was speed, like say with Jamarco Murray, or whether it was flexibility with say LaShawn McCoy or Matt Forte or you know people like that, they all had at least one athletic skill set trait that was really good, like amazing uh, or near amazing. And that's the only issue with Brian Hill is that he has good athleticism all overall. He has you know above average explosives, above average speed, and above average flexibility. But he doesn't have one athletic trait that is elite or that can be considered with the past elite running backs. But lots of positives, positives in terms of his uh, production profile, lots of positives in terms of his age profile. And I would not be surprised if Brian Hill has sort of a Ben Jarvis Green Ellis type of career. You know, we've seen backs like this a lot where they're not amazing, they're not great. But they're guys who know how to be a bell cow back. They're players that 
have enough athleticism to at least be a mismatch in certain situations. It's just they, they're not an elite running back. You know, Blau Powell even is you know, another sort of guy that's kind of like that. So, uh, you know, I think this is a good pick. You, you pick up a guy that uh, can come in and become a starter, knows how to be a starter on a team like Wyoming, knows how to get tons of carries in terms of his uh, sort of output. So I think this is a good pick for them, uh, but, you know, and also especially from where they got him. And we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of Eric Saber, uh, tight end out of Drake. When it comes to his production, he scored 89.99 in terms of uh, passing yardage market share production, uh, which this is the FCS level, but it at least hits high marks. I mean, he hits the all-pro mark, but again, this is FCS production, so the the thresholds at that level are a little, you know, the, the thresholds are, the model's based on FBS guys mostly, so... Uh, just take that into account that even though 89.99 is good, that's at Drake instead of like Alabama. And then we come to his athleticism where he scored 81.40 in terms of explosives for a size, 60.04 when it comes to speed for a size, and 49.42 when it comes to flexibility for a size. Uh, based on his athleticism, he has really good explosiveness marks that hit everything you need, but his speed and his flexibility don't really hit high quality outcomes. But... I still think he's going to become a long-term starter. I, there, there's potential there based on his production and also based on his above-average athleticism traits in terms of explosiveness and, based on, and, and also speed. He's just never really going to be an elite player, but this is a guy that can become a long-term starter, and I think I expect to become a long-term starter. So I think he's going to be a guy that's going to become a contributor early and develop into a, a starter for you guys. So I think that's a pretty decent pick uh, when you look at it, especially because it was late. Uh, so how do I feel about the Atlanta Falcons draft class? Well, unfortunately, you didn't get any players that hit high quality outcomes. And that's kind of the thing that people, people continually criticize me with these grades because they go, well, you know, nobody, you know, not everybody's going to be an all pro player or a high quality player. And I understand that. But the fact of the matter is, is that's the goal. The goal is to get a high quality player, to get a pro bowler, to get an all pro player. Like that's the goal is to get that type of player. In every draft class, you should be trying to find that type of player. Uh, so that's how I go into grading these drafts is what is the likelihood of this player becoming that. And unfortunately, none of the players that you drafted, I think, except for a couple that could buck the trend, Takers McKinley, I think, has enough positive indicators that there's a chance that he could become like a multiple Pro Bowl guy based on his production and based on his uh, age and other sort of factors. Uh, but everybody else, I just think, doesn't really have a high high likelihood of becoming a, uh, a Pro Bowl or All-Pro guy. But you got a ton of guys that are going to become starters. I think Duke Riley would not be surprised if he ends up being a day one starter. Takers McKinley, of course, is going to be a day one starter. Sean Harlow is going to be a day one starter. Uh, Brian Hill might even one day become a starter as a, you know, in case of injuries or whatever. Like he's a guy who at least has the athleticism and the potential base of production to become a starter. Eric Sabir has some athleticism traits indicating of starter. So you got a ton of players that are very unlikely to bust, but just aren't very likely to become high-quality players. That's a good draft in my book, because <laughs> there's some teams that didn't even do that. Uh, so I think this is a good draft class. Again, I, I don't think you got very many players that have a high likelihood of becoming a high-quality player, but you did get a ton of players that at least have a very good shot of being starters, and I think that's a good draft class because of that. Uh, so again, my name is James Coburn. You can find my work at draftcoburn.wordpress.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at Geometrix. And if you like this channel, if you like the content that I provide for you guys, uh, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. That helps me out a ton. Uh, you know, that's basically the best way to help me out is just to, you know, like and subscribe to this channel and, uh, and do that kind of stuff. And, uh, and yeah, and you can also share this video with friends, family, that sort of thing that also helps me out too. And I will talk to you guys in the next video. Peace.